Did you think this game had enough boards already? Well, uh, you got a lot more, yes. <laughs>Hi everyone and thanks for tuning in to a new episode of Beyond the Base Game. Currently I am going through the two expansions for Role Player. Now if you have not checked out my Monsters and Minions expansion video, I suggest you do that first because some of the aspects of this expansion also feature in that expansion and I don't really want to cover it in all the detail that I did there and just basically rinse repeat myself. So what do you get in this expansion compared to Monsters and Minions? And should you get this one first? No, this is still a really good expansion and I still recommend getting it, but I would say get Monsters and Minions first. Even though a lot of the stuff is replicated here, there are some additional elements which are really good, but also add just that little bit of an extra complexity and length to the game that you might not necessarily want when you're starting off with just the base set of roleplay. So, just to go over what's already covered in Monsters and Minions, the stuff I mentioned about, well, Monsters and Minions is already in this expansion as well. So you have monsters that you can fight at the end of the game. We've got Cyclops, Gorgon, Griffin, Hydra, Megapede, Leviathan. Uh, was there another one in there? Nope, that seems like most of them. So, and of course you've got solo and multiplayer versions of these. You have got the special location obstacle and... Uh, was it location obstacle and attack cards for them? So here we've got the Cyclops, Infestation, Blind Rage, Labyrinth, Heavy Fog. All players gain two combat die for each skill or trait they have, pointing left with the left arrow. All players gain two XP for each green die in the rightmost column. All players gain one combat die for each green die in that familiar row. More on that a bit later. But essentially, what you had in Monsters and Minions is copied here. You've just got more variety. So you have the combat dice. You've got the orange combat dice. You've got the blue experience cubes that you can use to power things like attribute actions or get more combat dice. You have the minions that you can go up against. And now you've got things like Giant Beetle, Naga, Sandworm. Oh, it's like June already. A tree Folk, Tyrannosaurus Rex, for reasons. Were Shark, Werewolf and Wraith. Oh, try saying those three fast when you're drunk. Doppelganger and a Draug. D-R-A-U-G. Uh, is that like a... I think I've heard of a Draug before. My knowledge on D&D is a little bit limited. But it looks kind of like a... It looks a bit like a Drow Elf, except it looks more like a Dwarf. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on that. I'm sure you'll correct me in the comments, no doubt. But you've also got the Honor tokens. You've got the Injury tokens. So... All of that is basically identical to Monsters and Minions. So if you liked it in that expansion, you're going to like it in this one as well. You get more of it. Great. So what's new then? What's the point of this expansion? Or is it just more of the same? Because I know I gave the caveat that I didn't want something that was just more of the same. No, there are some big key differences with this one though. Firstly, new dice for the bag. Yeah, I mean, you already had boost dice in the previous expansion. Now you've got what's called split dice. These are, in my opinion more interesting than the boost dice because the boost dice are basically colorless but they have higher values these though cap at four pips so they can only go from one two three or four so you're thinking well that seems a bit naff you know they're not particularly good for attributes then no but what they are good for is colors they're split because they have two two colors on them they're dual colored so this is white and green, this is blue and red, purple and black, white and red, green and black, you know, they, all, they come in all the different combinations. And the idea is, is that when you pop these on your tribute row, they count for both colors. So fulfilling your backstory or fulfilling the, the, the special cards for the monster, for example, where it talks about red cards, well now they fit. Uh, maybe a certain trait card that you had wants you to have a bunch of red dice on your thing. Well, if you get one that's blue and red, it counts as red, therefore it can count for those cards as well. So it's just another cool way to customize your sheet. When these turn up on the initiative row, you're kind of thinking, oh, maybe I can sacrifice a bit of the value because I only need a 12 in intelligence, but I've been looking for a red. Oh, finally, that is red. I'll go for it. Some other people might avoid it because it's too low pit, so it could be quite low on the initiative row. Bear in mind, they're arranged in terms of numerical order. So something that's capped at four, chances are it will turn up quite low on the initiative row. So you might be able to go, well, I can take a low die. It means I'm going first on the market row. You see what I mean? It's some extra considerations for you. Now, earlier on, I mentioned familiars. Huh? What's a familiar? Well, that's where these come in. Yeah. Did you think this game had enough boards already? Well, uh, you got a lot more. Yes. <laughs> if you like boards, then this is the thing to get. And seriously, if you're going to get both of these expansions, seriously consider the big box. You're going to need it to store everything in one box. It will be physically impossible otherwise. And certainly, as I showed you on the last video, 
Hey, get it up there. If you can get the big box and the folded space insert for it, then yeah, definitely worth the money. Shameless plug there. But the familiars are another thing that you start the game with. And much like the classes, you mainly just pick one based on theme, but they do have their little quirks. It's an additional board that you put above your character sheet, and it has three more spots that you can put dice in. Now, essentially, you fill this up as well as your character sheet. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's going to add another three rounds to the game, but we'll get onto that in a bit. But let's take this one here. Long-tailed weasel. Don't you just want that as your familiar? And, and essentially, it has an attribute row, just like everything else, and you build up its power, its rating, like your strength and dexterity in the same way. But you have a special ability that goes off every time you place a die in a row. So, for example, here, when you place a die on Long-Tailed Weasel, gain two Charisma tokens or three Honor tokens. Pretty sweet. It's got its own little backstory, which has points for scoring if you can fulfill the colors. And it has a power rating, usually in the small region of about six to eight. It could be lower, it could even be slightly higher. And the idea is, is that to score the points for that, you need to make certain that the row doesn't exceed or, you know, it has to be within the range of the power it says. So that gives you a reason to maybe go for those split dice, because they don't cap it. They cap it four. You don't want a high power for the familiar, so maybe these are really good for that. But there is a lot of these, and there's just some fun thematic combinations you can have. Longtail Weasel, Ice Bear, uh, Jackalope, uh, Tempest Fox, Blood Badger, you. <laughs> Horn Viper, Nalus Leopard, Scorch Phoenix. That's an awesome pet. Seriously, Weasel or Phoenix? <laughs> Come on, seriously. Ancient Tortoise. That's pretty cool as well. Silver Warthog, Screech Owl, uh, Draggle Wolf, Flame Imp, uh, Shadow Drake, and a Cursed Raven. There's a lot in here. Now, I can't be certain that some of them weren't Kickstarter based, although I don't think the Kickstarter included many extra boards. I think they were all stretch goals anyway, so I think everything that you get in Fiends of Familiar is here. So, although don't quote me on that, but there's just a lot of variety here. I mean, power rating 5 to 6, 8 to 9, 7 to 8, 5 to 6, 5 to 7, you know, they range. And the abilities, uh, when you place a die on Tempest Fox, swap the faces of any two dice on your character sheet, excluding the special dice. When you place a die on a Blood Badger, you can banish a Fiend card. What's a Fiend? We'll get onto that. Uh, when you place a die on Silver Warthog, you may move the rightmost die in any attribute row to the leftmost empty space in a different row. So there's a lot of cool things you can do with this. But essentially, it's another thing to fill on your board. It's something else for a bit of fun theme and referencing. This is pretty cool. But there is a knock-on effect. It technically does add three rounds to the game if you left it as that. But they have thought of this. Firstly, you have a revised initiative uh, card row, so the card, like initiative cards are slightly different, and you'll notice this one, well you won't notice it because it's too far, but it has a picture of a fiend on it. As I say, we'll get to that later, but the main thing that's handy is this one card here, the Call to Adventure card. It is a setup guide, effectively. What you do is that it tells you with whatever combination of expansion you have, how to build up the market deck. So for example, if I'm just playing with Fiends and I've got three players, I must discard 15 cards from the top of the market deck based on the players, all right? If I use both expansions and four players, I discard 35 cards. And then what you do is that you insert this card at a position as specified here. So uh, three players under the 23rd card. So you just count and slot it in. Well, what does it do? Well, the idea is, is that until you draw this card from the deck, you place two dice on every initiative card instead of one. Normally each round you get one die and you put it on your board. So with a normal character sheet, you're essentially doing three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18 you know, rounds in the game. If you were to do this with the Fiend and Familiar, you would have 21 rounds. But what this Call to Adventure card does is that for a good third, if not half of the game, it effectively doubles the speed. You get two dice at a time rather than one die. So you're filling up two spaces on your character sheet per round. What this does is basically makes up for the fact that you've got this on your thing. So if anything, I think it slightly speeds up the game like a little bit in general, but for the most part, it essentially just makes up for this. So whatever extra time this adds, this negates. Now what on earth am I going on about when I say about fiends? Well, the higher initiative cards in the game now have a picture of a fiend on them. So four and five, depending on the player count, it varies. But essentially, it's a, a penalty for taking the higher value dice. 
Because let's face it, a lot of the times you'll be like, well, I go last in the market, but you know what? Six is six, is six is a good. Well, now you have a detriment for to always take those. And essentially, every time you take an initiative card that has the fiend on it, you have to take the fiend that's on top of it and put it next to your board. These fiends confer all sorts of nasty negative effects on you. Pay double for the cost of an armor card or a weapon card. Can't place dice in your familiar row. Can't use skills. Gain an injury when you go on a hunt. Uh, gain two injury if you place a die in your intelligence or wisdom row. You must spend an initial gold for every card you buy. You know, and this is just a, a small selection of them. There's plenty more in the box. These can be annoying if they come up at the wrong time, but then at the end of the day, you're choosing whether to pick the card, unless you were last to go in it and choosing it, in which case, oh well, tough. But, you know, these things can pop up and they can ruin your day, or they can just be a minor nuisance. And that's kind of the detriment I do have with this element. I do like the fact that it balances the higher value initiative cards. It's another decision to make about whether it's worth to take those fives and sixes, knowing you're gonna to have to deal with the fiend. But dealing with the fiend isn't that tricky. <laughs> There's, like, I mentioned one familiar that can get rid of them pretty easily. Okay, cool, that's if you have it. But certain cards can benefit or banish fiends from you. So it's like, okay, that's another way to get rid of them. But your general way of getting rid of them is to either spend a charisma token. So you're going to get three of those during the game anyway. Or, and let's face it, did you ever really use a charisma token that much to discount your market cards? No, nah, you typically save them for fiends now but also spend five gold. Okay, so get a bunch of money, you can get rid of the fiend. I mean, these fiends aren't designed to ruin your entire game forever. You know, they're just designed to be, well, as a fiend typically would be, a nuisance. But sometimes you find a fiend and you just don't care. So for example, I mentioned here, fiend of treason. When you buy a weapon card, you must pay double the normal cost. What if I'm not after weapons? What if I never buy a weapon? This fiend does nothing for me. There's no other penalty for having a fiend. I could have this fiend and another fiend and another fiend and they might just not hinder me at all. So I'm getting the benefit of the higher value initiative cards while not really suffering any major penalty. Okay, maybe a good weapon comes up and it's like, mm, I don't really want to pay double for it. All right, fine, I'll move on to something else. But it's not often that, you know, some of these do seem a little bit more annoying than others. You know, it has to be said, but... It's a relatively small niggle, you know, other than that, I still think it's pretty solid and it's a nice inclusion, but yeah, maybe just like some extra detriments or maybe just not as many ways to get rid of the card. Although if you did that, you probably would have people being screwed for the entire game with a bad fiend. So, you know, tomato, tomato, but I do like it. I just don't think it's the best aspect of this expansion. It doesn't extend the length of the game that much, really. If anything, you just get that one monster phase and that's it. Here though, by adding the weasel, yes, you have the call to adventure board, but it's still more to consider, more for people to potentially sub be subject to analysis paralysis on. It's another element of complication in the game because you need to explain how these work compared to a normal character sheet, which we you know is different from how a character sheet works. You've also got to explain how the fiends work. That's another complication. So, you know, they're not overly complicated rules but let's just say you're going to teach this to new players you may be less keen to teach some of the fiend and familiar elements compared to the monster element which i think you should throw into every game regardless if i'm playing with gamers i probably would just throw in the fiends and familiar stuff anyway and teach it with it it certainly is possible but then it's also pretty easy to extract it as well you simply just don't use the call to adventure card you don't use these and you don't use the fiends other than that you can just play the game as it were but it's a solid expansion i don't think it's as good as the monsters and minions one mainly because of the extra complexity which is fine you know i like it but just not as much as it's not let's shall we say it's it's not as big an impressive addition to the game as the monsters and minions were when they first appeared in the monsters and minions expansion it's weird having to say that twice every time i talk about the title but there you go so that concludes my overview of the Fiends and Familiars expansion. I hope you've enjoyed the two videos I've done on Roleplayer. I've got some ideas as to which ones to do next. I know that there was some popular votes for the Architects of the West Kingdom Artisans expansion. I know that there was particularly on Patreon uh, a lot of uh, buzz for me doing the Fractures of Time expansion for Anachrony. So I will 
get round to playing that solo a few times and, you know, relearn the rules and try and get that one done for an overview video. And of course, people have pointed out some interesting alternatives to what I put originally, like, for example, the Seasons expansions. That's a potential. But then there's also the Isle of Sky expansions. There's ooh, all sorts, the Civilization Terror Incognita, the Robinson Crusoe, the, this War of Mine, Days of the Siege. I just got in the post today. I could do that one. You name it. There's a lot of expansions. The series could go on for a long time just by going through my collection, but hopefully the views will justify it. But mainly I'm glad that the engagement is justified it because a lot of you have given some very good positive feedback and have really filled out the comment sections with a lot of interesting points and views on the game. So if you like these expansions, tell everyone your thoughts on them. And until next time, remember as always, it's only a game. Take care and I'll see you soon.